Hi guys and welcome back to my Evilness podcast or to my Evilness channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. Disclaimer, I mean absolutely no harm to anyone who I may mention in my podcast or video. It is all just information that I have compiled via the internet and news articles and put together to tell you about today's case which is the true crime case of Martin Bryant, who you may know as being the man allegedly responsible for the Port Arthur Massacre. On the 28th of April, 1996, Bryant began the day by getting up early, which was unusual for him due to his lack of commitments. Bryant left the house at 9.47am, according to the home security system. Bryant drove to Fawcett, reaching Fawcett at around 11am. He then continued on to Port Arthur and was seen driving into Seascape along the Arthur Highway at about 11.45am. He stopped at the Seascape guest accommodation site, a site which his father had wanted to buy but was beaten to it by the current owners, David and Nolene, who was known as Sally Martin. Bryant attributed the refusal to sell to his father's depression, which ultimately led to his suicide. His father's death hit him hard, and Bryant felt like he had lost the only man he could ever talk to. So on the morning of the 28th of April 1996, after arriving at Seascape Guest Accommodation, Bryant made his way inside and fired several gunshots. He then proceeded to gag and stab David Martin. Witness testimonies at the time differ about the actual number of shots fired, but it was stated in court that it was believed this was the time that Bryant killed the Martins. Around this time, A couple stopped at Seascape and met Bryant outside. When asked if they could look at the accommodation, Bryant told them they could not at his... Bryant told them that they could not as his parents were away and his girlfriend was inside. His demeanour was described as quite rude and the couple felt uncomfortable. They left at around 12.35pm. Bryant then drove to Port Arthur taking the keys to the Seascape property after locking the doors. So the Seascape property was along the highway, which was along the way to Port Arthur, not actually in Port Arthur. Bryant stopped at a car that was stopped on the side of the road due to overheating. He talked to the two occupants and suggested that they go to the Port Arthur cafe for some coffee later. Bryant drove past the Port Arthur historic site towards a Palmer's Lookout Road property, which was also owned by the Martins, where he encountered Roger Lana, whom he spoke to for a few minutes before leaving. But in Roger's witness statement, he said he did not recognise this man as Bryant until he identified himself. About 1.10pm, Bryant paid the entry fee for the site and parked his yellow Volvo near the water's edge by the Broad Arrow Cafe. The site's security manager told him to park back with the other cars as that area was reserved for camper vans and the car park was busy that day. The security manager saw him go up to the cafe carrying a sports type bag but ignored him. Bryant proceeded to the cafe and purchased himself some lunch and coffee, which he ate on the outside deck. He rambled to people about the lack of European wasps in the area and there not being as many Japanese tourists in the area. It was said he appeared nervous. Bryant finished his meal and returned his tray to inside the cafe. He placed his bag on a table and pulled out a Colt AR-15 SP-1 carbine with a cult scope and a 30 round magazine attached the cafe was small and quite busy that day as many people waited for the next ferry 
Bryant pointed his rifle at the table next to him and fatally shot Malaysian tourists Mo Yi and Su Ling. Bryant then fired a shot at Mick Sargent, grazing his scalp and knocking him to the floor. He then fatally shot Sargent's girlfriend, Kate Elizabeth Scott, hitting her in the back of the head. 28-year-old New Zealand winemaker Jason Winter had been helping the cafe staff as Bryant turned in the direction of Jason's wife Joanne and their one-year-old son Mitchell. Jason threw a serving tray at Bryant to try to distract him. Joanne's father pushed his daughter and grandson to the floor and under a table. 44-year-old Anthony Nightingale stood up after the sound of the first shots. Nightingale yelled, no, not here, as Bryant pointed the gun at him. As Nightingale leaned forward, he was shot through the neck and spine, killing him. Bryant fired one shot that killed Kevin Vincent Sharp, who was 68. He then shot again, this time at 66-year-old Walter Bennett. The bullet passed through his body and hit 67-year-old Raymond John Sharp, Kevin Sharp's brother killing both of these men. Gerald Broom, Gay Fiddler and her husband, John Fiddler, were all hit with bullet fragments but survived. Bryant then turned towards Tony and Sarah Christian and Andrew Mills. Andrew was shot in the head. Tony Christian was also shot in the head but had managed to push his wife down prior to getting shot. Bryant then turned towards Tony and Sarah Kiston and Andrew Mills. Andrew was shot in the head. Tony Kiston was also shot in the head, but had managed to push his wife down prior to getting shot. Apparently, Bryant did not see Sarah hiding under the table. Thelma Walker and Pamela Law were injured by fragments before their friend, Peter Croswell, dragged them to the ground. The three took cover under a table. Patricia Barker was also injured by bullet fragments. Bryant moved slightly and started shooting at the table where Graham Collier, Carolyn Lawton and her daughter Sarah were sitting. Graham was shot in the jaw. Sarah ran towards her mother who was moving between tables. Carolyn threw herself on top of her daughter. Bryant shot Carolyn in the back. Her eardrum ruptured by the muzzle blast from the gun being so close to her ear. Despite Carolyn's efforts, Sarah had been killed by a shot to the head. Bryant turned around and shot Mervyn Howard, killing him. The bullet passed through him, through a window of the cafe and hit a table on the outside deck. Bryant then shot and killed Mervyn's wife, Mary Howard. Bryant was near the exit, stopping anyone from trying to escape. Bryant then moved across the cafe to the gift shop. As he moved, Robert Elliott stood up. Robert was shot in the arm and head, but he survived. From the moment the first shot was fired, about 15 seconds had passed. During those 15 seconds, Bryant fired 17 shots, killing 12 people and wounding 10 more. Bryant moved towards the gift shop. Many people took this chance to hide under tables and behind shop displays. Bryant shot and killed the two local women who worked there. Nicole Burgess, 17, was shot in the head and Elizabeth Howard, 26, was shot in the arm and chest. Coralie Lever and Vera Jari hid behind a hessian or burlap screen with some other people. Coralie's husband, Dennis, was killed by a gunshot to the head. Pauline Masters, Ron Jari, Vera's husband, and Peter and Carolyn Nash had attempted to escape through a locked door, but could not open it. Peter Nash lay on top of his wife to shield her. Gwen Neander, trying to get to the door, was shot in the head and killed. Bryant saw movement in the cafe and moved back to near the door. He shot at a table and hit Peter Croswell in the buttocks, who had been hiding under the table. 
Jason Winter, who was hiding in the gift shop, thought Bryant had left the building and said something to that effect to people near him before moving out into the open. Bryant saw him with Jason pleading, no, no, but Bryant shot him anyway, hitting Jason in his hand, neck and chest. Fragments from these shots hit American tourist Dennis Olsen, who was hiding with Mary Olsen, his wife, and Jason Winter. The fragments left Dennis with injuries to his hand, eye, scalp and chest, but Dennis survived. Bryant walked back through the cafe to the gift shop where he shot and killed Ronald Jari, Peter Nash and Pauline Masters. He did not see Carolyn Nash, who was laying under her husband. Bryant then aimed the gun at an unidentified Taiwanese man. The identity of this man was suppressed by the Director of Public Prosecutions and it is actually reported as an Asian man, but he was Taiwanese. Um, but the magazine was empty. Bryant then moved to the counter of the gift shop, reloaded his rifle and left the empty magazine before leaving the building. In the cafe and gift shop, Bryant fired 29 shots, killing 20 people and wounding 12. While Bryant was shooting in the cafe, some staff had managed to escape through the kitchen and alert people nearby. There were buses outside with lines of people, many of who then hid in the bushes or nearby buildings. Some people thought the noise was some kind of historical reenactment and moved towards the area. Ashley Law, a site employee, was ushering people away from the cafe into the information centre when Bryant fired at him from between 50 to 100 metres or 50 to 110 yards away, but Bryant missed him. Bryant then moved towards the buses. One of the bus drivers, Royce Thompson, was shot in the back as he was moving along the side of a bus. Royce fell to the ground but was able to crawl under the bus but later died of his wounds. Bridget Cook was attempting to guide people between the buses and along the jetty area to cover but Bryant saw them trying to hide and shot at them. Bridget was shot in the right thigh causing the bone to fragment. The bullet lodged there. Another bus driver, Ian McElwill, was hit by Cook's bone fragments both were able to escape though and they both survived. Bryant then moved around another bus and shot at more people who were hiding there. Winifred Alpin, while running for cover behind another bus, was killed by a gunshot to her side. Another of his bullets grazed Yvonne Lockley's cheek but she was able to get onto one of the buses to hide and she also survived. People had started moving from the car park towards the jetty but someone shouted that Bryant was heading that way, so they turned back. Bryant then moved to where Janet and Neville Quinn, who owned a wildlife park on Tasmania's east coast, were starting to move away from the buses. Bryant shot Janet in the back where she felt unable to move. Bryant continued along the car park as people were trying to escape and hide. Doug Hutchinson was trying to get onto a bus when he was shot in the arm. Doug ran around to the front of the bus, then along to the shore of the jetty, and hit. Bryant then went to his yellow Volvo, just past the buses, and changed to a self-loading rifle. He shot at Dennis Cromer, who was near the penitentiary ruins. Gravel flew up in front of her as the bullets hit the ground. Bryant then returned to his car and sat there for a few moments before getting out again and returning to the buses. Some people were hiding behind cars in the car park but could still be seen by Bryant. When they realised Bryant had seen them, they ran into the bush. He fired several shots, all of which missed. Bryant moved back to the buses where Janet Quinn lay injured. He proceeded to shoot her in the back, killing her. Bryant then boarded one of the buses and fatally shot Elva Gaylord in the arm and chest. 
In a bus opposite, Gordon Francis saw what happened and moved to try to shut the bus doors. Bryant saw him and shot him from the next bus. He survived, but he needed four major operations. Neville Quinn, Janet's husband, had escaped the car park area, but returned to find his wife after being forced to leave her, after Bryant had earlier shot her. Bryant exited the bus, spotting Neville. He proceeded to chase him around the buses, firing at least two shots before Neville ran onto a bus. Bryant boarded the bus, pointed the gun in Neville's face, saying, No one gets away from me. Neville ducked when he realised that Bryant was about to pull the trigger. The bullet missed his head but hit him in the neck, temporarily paralysing him. Neville Quinn was airlifted away and he survived. Bryant fired at James Belasco, a US citizen, hitting a nearby car. Belasco was also attempting to film the shooter. By this time, Bryant had killed 26 people and injured another 18. Bryant then returned his car and left the car park. Witnesses say he was beeping the horn and waving as he drove. Bryant drove along Jetty Road towards the toll booth where people were running away. Bryant passed at least two people. About 600 metres or 660 yards down the road, Nanette Mikak, 36, and her daughters, Alana, 6, and Madeline, 3. Nanette was carrying Madeline and Alana was slightly ahead. Bryant opened his car door and slowed down. Nanette moved towards the car, seemingly thinking someone was stopping to help. Bryant stepped out of the car and told Nanette to get on her knees. She did so. He then shot her in the temple, killing her instantly. Next, he shot and killed Madeline and chased Alana, who had ran and hid behind a tree before shooting and killing her. Bryant drove up to the toll booth where there was multiple vehicles and blocked a 1980 BMW 7 Series owned by Mary Nixon. In this car were Mary, driver Russell James Pollard and passengers Helene and Robert Salzman. An argument between Robert and Bryant ensued and Bryant took out his rifle and shot and killed him. Russell Pollard emerged from the car and moved towards Bryant before also being fatally shot in the chest. Bryant then moved to the BMW and killed Mary and Helene before taking them from the car. Bryant then moved his ammo, handcuffs, the AR-15 rifle and a fuel container to the BMW. Another car then came towards the toll booth and Bryant shot at it. Graham Sutherland was hit with glass but quickly reversed back up the road and left to alert a nearby service station as to what was happening. Bryant then got into the BMW, leaving his Volvo 244, including his Daewoo shotgun and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. By now, Bryant killed 33 people and injured 19 more. Bryant drove up to a service station and cut off a white Toyota Corolla that was attempting to exit out onto the highway. Glenn Pears was driving and his girlfriend Zoe Hall was in the passenger seat. Bryant quickly got out of his car and made Glenn get into the boot of the BMW. Bryant then moved to the passenger side of the Corolla, raised his rifle and fired three shots killing Zoe. The service station attendant told everyone to lie down and he locked the main doors. He got his rifle, but by the time he could get some ammunition and load it, Bryant had left in the BMW. A police officer arrived several minutes later and set out in pursuit of Bryant. Zoe was Bryant's 34th victim. There are some reports that state a child was also in the car but the only children that were killed by Martin Bryant were Alana and Madeline Mikak. After Bryant left the service station, he headed back to Seascape. He shot at a red Ford Falcon coming from the opposite direction, smashing its front windscreen. <laughs> Upon arriving back at Seascape, Bryant got out of his car, 
when a Holden Frontera four-wheel drive approached. The occupants saw Bryant with his gun but thought he was rabbit hunting and slowed down as they passed him. Bryant fired at the car. The first bullet hit the bonnet and broke the throttle cable. He fired at least two more shots at the car as it passed, breaking the windows. One bullet hit Linda White, who was driving the four-wheel drive, in the arm. Another car then drove down the road. It was not until they were almost directly across from Bryant that they realised that he had a gun. Bryant shot at the car, smashing the windscreen. Douglas Horner was wounded by glass from the windscreen. The car proceeded forward to where Linda and another occupant of Linda's car were, but Douglas didn't realise their situation and drove on. When they noticed that Linda had been shot, they doubled back and picked them up. Then they made their way to the Fox and Hounds Inn where they called the police. Another car drove past and Bryant shot at it, hitting Susan Williams, the passenger, in the hand. Simon Williams, who was driving, was hit by fragments. The driver of another vehicle saw this and reversed back up the road. Bryant did fire at this car, also hitting it, but he did not injure anyone. Bryant then got into the stolen BMW with Glenn Pez still in the boot and drove down the seascape driveway to the house. Shortly after, Bryant removed Glenn Pears from the boot and handcuffed him to a stair rail in the house. Bryant also set the BMW on fire sometime after arriving at around 2pm. Upon arriving back at Seascape, Bryant got out of his car. A Holden Frontera four-wheel drive then approached. The occupants saw Bryant with his gun but thought that he was rabbit hunting and slowed down as they passed him. Bryant fired at the car. The first bullet hit the bonnet and broke the throttle cable. He fired at least two more shots at the car as it passed, breaking the windows. One of these bullets hit Linda White, who was driving the four-wheel drive, in the arm. Another car then drove down the road. It was not until they were almost directly across from Bryant that they realised that he had a gun. Bryant shot at the car, smashing the windscreen. Douglas Horner was wounded by glass from the windscreen. The car proceeded forward to where Linda and another occupant of Linda's car were, but Douglas did not realise their situation and drove on. When they noticed that Linda had been shot, they doubled back and picked them up. Then they made their way to the Fox and Hounds Inn where they called the police. Another car drove past and Bryant shot at it, hitting Susan Williams, who was the passenger, in the hand. Simon Williams, who was driving was hit by fragments. The driver of another vehicle saw this and reversed back up the road. Bryant did fire at this car, also hitting it, but he did not injure anyone. Bryant then got into the stolen BMW with Glenn Pears still in the boot and drove down the Seascape driveway to the house. Shortly after, Bryant removed Glenn from the boot and handcuffed him to a stair rail in the house. Bryant also set the BMW on fire sometime after arriving, around 2pm. An 18-hour standoff ensured once police arrived shortly after. Some reports state that this is when the Martins were killed. Hostage negotiations stopped due to Bryant's phone battery dying. Bryant was apprehended the following morning after a fire was started in the lower level of the house at approximately 8am. After the fire started, Bryant was allegedly taunting police to come and get him. But police believing the hostage was already dead decided the fire would eventually bring Bryant out. After about 30 minutes, Bryant ran out of the house with his clothing on fire, resulting in burns to his back and buttocks. 
He was arrested and taken to the Royal Hobart Hospital, which being Hobart and really all of Southern Tasmania's only public hospital, meant that Bryant was being treated in the same hospital as his victims. But management assured the public that Bryant was in an isolated wing under heavy police guard. There were rumours that some nurses refused to treat Bryant, but this was adamantly denied by management. Bryant was held in the Royal Hobart Hospital while awaiting trial. One guard said there had been at least two job applications made by people wanting revenge on Bryant. In a police interview, Bryant admitted to kidnapping Glenn Pears, but denied shooting anyone and claimed he did not take a Corolla from the toll booth area and that his hostage was taken from the area in the boot of the BMW. Initially, Bryant pled not guilty, which led to a change in lawyer to now disgraced lawyer John Avery. He ended up embezzling money to buy art. So he defended Bryant and who Bryant gave his written confession to for the 19th of November 1996 court hearing where Bryant was found guilty of all charges, which were 35 sentences of life imprisonment for each count of murder, 25 years for the remaining 36 charges for five offences, which were 20 attempted murders, three counts of infliction of grievous bodily harm, the infliction of wounds upon a further eight persons, four counts of aggravated assault and one count of unlawfully setting fire to property. He was sentenced to 35 life sentences plus 1,652 years, with all sentences to be served concurrently in Hobart's Risdom Prison without the possibility of parole, which is extremely rare in Australia. Most murder sentences eventually allow for the possibility of parole. And Bryant is still in the Risdom Prison complex to this day. During his imprisonment, Bryant has gained a substantial amount of weight. Purportedly, this is from giving sexual favours in the prison canteen. The Port Arthur Massacre happened only a month after the Dunblane School Massacre in Scotland. The two communities sent each other items to place at their respective memorials. Walter Mickack, who lost his wife and two daughters, along with two other survivors of the massacre, Gay and John Fiddler, founded the Alana and Madeline Foundation, a charity dedicated to keeping children safe from violence. As a result of the massacre, the government moved to put new gun laws in place in Australia. The ownership and use of of self-loading rifles and self-loading shotguns were restricted and controls tightened on recreational use. The government initiated a mandatory buyback scheme with gun owners paid according to a table of valuations. Over half a million guns were handed in, costing around $350 million. There has been much debate regarding Bryant's mental health at the time of the offences. He was in receipt of a disability support pension on the basis of being mentally handicapped. Media reports detailed his odd behaviour as a child. At 12, he made the news after injuring himself playing with firecrackers. Bryant did not have a car licence or a gun licence. Okay, so there is also a big conspiracy theory around the Port Arthur Massacre, so I am going to tell you a little bit about that also. So there was and still is a lot of controversy surrounding the Port Arthur Massacre. Some people claim that Bryant was set up to take the fall and that this was planned to enforce stricter gun laws in Australia. At the time, Tasmania's gun laws were the most relaxed. Some facts to support this theory are On the Sunday morning, approximately two hours before the murders, ten senior managers were taken to a two-day seminar on the East Coast with a vague agenda and no visiting speakers. 
Right before the shooting started, the only two policemen in the area were called away on a wild goose chase. They were dispatched to a coal mine at Saltwater River to investigate a heroin stash. This heroin stash turned out to be soap powder. Now though, when the call came in about a shooter, they were too far away to be able to get back to the Broad Arrow Cafe within a good time frame. Had the policemen remained at Dun Alley, they could have closed the swinging bridge to prevent the shooter from leaving the area. Could Bryant, with an IQ of 66, have planned this decoy? About six weeks before the massacre, the Broad Arrow Cafe was allegedly purchased by the government. Shortly before the massacre, a specially built 22 capacity refrigerated mortuary truck was built. No other state in Australia had one, not even New South Wales or Victoria, where other massacres have occurred, which was advertised for sale by Chris White, a police officer with Tasmania Police who also promised the whole Port Arthur story would be given as well. Also remember, 20 were killed in the Broad Arrow Cafe alone. A naked woman was allegedly seen running naked around Seascape during the standoff. If Nolene had been killed earlier, who was this woman? When only three bodies were discovered in Seascape, the unidentified Taiwanese man, who was reported as Asian and had his identity suppressed by the Director of Public Prosecutions. Why? Two shots were allegedly fired at Port Arthur at 6.30pm, while Bryant was at Seascape. A woman who ate lunch at the Broad Arrow Cafe just before 1.30pm said the shooter had a freckled face. Graham Collier, an ex-soldier who got a look at the shooter, said he had a pock-marked face which is basically acne, which Bryant did not have. Graham Collier said in his police statement it was not Bryant who shot him in the neck. At a police seminar in Queensland where forensic gun inspector Gerald Dutton gave a talk, Mr Ian McNiven asked Dutton if there was any empirical evidence to link Martin Bryant to the Broad Arrow Cafe. Sergeant Dutton immediately shut down the 15-minute question time and would not answer. When McNiven said, I have here Graham Collier's police statement, Sergeant Dutton threatened him with arrest and called for security to escort McNiven out of the building. When asked the same question by a doctor at a seminar in America, he replied, there is no empirical evidence to link Brian to the cafe. Wendy Skur, a nurse, tour guide and ambulance officer, rang triple zero at 1.32pm to report the shooting. She and other medics then cared for the dead and tended the injured for six and a half hours without any police protection. The armed police apparently stopped at Tirana for a barbecue. Some police also arrived by boat, so near the car park, but failed to go into the cafe to tend to the people. On the 30th of April, the Mercury, which is a Hobart newspaper, printed an old photo of Bryant illegally. This was illegal as some of the witnesses had not been interviewed or asked to identify the killer. When one witness was asked to describe clothing worn by the gunman, she described the clothing in the old photo instead of what he had actually been wearing. The Herald Sun also published Bryant's photo, altering his eyes to make him look more crazy. The police set the BMW on fire, allegedly, to prevent Bryant from escaping, but also doing this would have destroyed any DNA. A police video also shows items such as a solo can, a glass, a knife, fork and plate were on the table with the blue sports bag, but no DNA samples or fingerprints were taken. There was a World Press Convention to be held on the 30th of April. 
Those attending the convention were to arrive over the weekend for an early start Monday. It was always said the shooter shot from the hip, so 20 shots hit in one and a half minutes from the hip, fired by an allegedly disabled man with an IQ of 66. A photo in which Bryant was in the car park, but two other men are on the deck at the Broad Arrow Cafe. The time on this photo is 2.45pm. On the Sunday morning, 25 specialist doctors, the Royal Australian College of Surgeons from all over Australia, were attending a training course in Hobart and the last lecture had been on terrorist attacks and gunshot wounds. These doctors stayed and helped care for the wounded. A book called The Second Empty Chair delves a lot into this theory. So there is another theory. Joe Viles, the author of Deadly Deception at Port Arthur, has always stated that the Port Arthur massacre was a Mossad operation. Joe Viles was once known as Ari Ben Menashe and wrote a book called Prophets of War. This book was meant to be his autobiography and detailed his attacks as an Israeli intelligence agent prior to settling in Australia and becoming Joe Viles. And whether it was a birth name or whether he changed it in Australia, if you met Ari Ben Menashe, he introduced himself as Joe Viles. Joe's understanding of the Port Arthur Massacre was extremely comprehensive and unique. Joe had knowledge of the gunman that was denied to the public He showed his knowledge when after reading Graham Collier's witness statement and when reading that the shooter had a pitted or acneed face, Joe stated, no, not acne, chickenpox. How could Joe possibly know this without knowing what Graham Collier saw that day? But Shooter's News had now revealed how Joe had that information. Joe was at the Port Arthur historic site at the time of the massacre and was involved with people known to be employed by the Australian government at that time. So how could Joe know that this was a Mossad covert operation? Simply, the Mossad agent that ran the Port Arthur massacre was named Ari Ben Menashe. That's right, it was Joe Viles. This explains how Joe could be so certain that it was a Mossad covert operation because he ran it. Sandy Hook was actually also believed to have been an Israeli or Mossad or CIA New World Order false flag operation. So that's a lot to consider. So the book that I mentioned before, The Second Empty Chair, The Port Arthur Paradox, was written which has changed some people's minds regarding the Port Arthur Massacre and Martin Bryant's guilt. A movie called Wasp, The Port Arthur Massacre, is set to be released sometime in 2021, but I could not find an actual date. This movie was actually filmed in New South Wales, not Tasmania, due to the still raw feelings about the massacre in Tasmania. Um, There is also another film set to be released called Nitrum, I believe is how you pronounce it, which is Martin Backwoods, um, another film about the massacre. Uh, The state cinema in Tasmania was planning to show that um, there was a lot of people that were not happy about this but I believe they are going to go ahead and show select screenings and that's due to come out really soon and that is all for today's case thank you so much for listening or watching I know it was a long one I appreciate it if you've made it to the end Uh, a like or subscribe would make you pretty amazing I will get another one done really soon Have a great day. Bye.